live from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Developing right now, a man charged in the hit and run case that took the life of a six month old boy. Ben? Dodging the drops, multiple chances of rain this week, and our first could be as soon as tonight. Okay, Ben, but we begin with a big shakeup at Ford. Mark Fields is out and Jim Hackett is in as the company's new CEO. Thanks for being with us for the news at five. The move is billed as a change in course for the company and that change is ending Mark Fields three year tenure as CEO. So now it is Hackett who will lead Ford's transition really from car company to mobility company. A little background on Hackett, 62 years old, previously served as CEO of Grand Rapids based steel case. Perhaps around here, best known as the man who helped or hired Jim Harbaugh during his tenure as the interim athletic director at U of M, but also a Ford board member and been with Ford now for about a year or so. Business editor Rod Maloney live in Dearborn tonight. With all of that, though, Rod, uh, uh, I think a surprising move. Yeah, no doubt about it, Devin. I mean, look, let's face it, Jim Hackett wasn't on anybody's radar when it came to automotive succession here at Ford. And there were many, though the board was concerned, thinking that perhaps they wouldn't have to replace the CEO at this point. But as things stand right now, Bill Ford is saying, no, he saw the change had to be made. And he sees a lot in Hackett that he saw in another one of his hires, Alan Mulally. Bill Ford Jr. introduced Jim Hackett to the automotive press this morning, although he's better known to the Michigan sports press. He's the guy who snared Jim Harbaugh as the Wolverines coach. But he does offer much more than athletic know-how to Ford, and Bill Jr. was quick to point that out, citing his 20-year stint as Steelcase Furniture CEO. Jim said no. Let's imagine the future of the workplace. Let's imagine how people are going to work and want to work in the future, and then let's build our company around that. What Fields apparently failed with is getting the company to push into the mobility age with confidence, clarity, and camaraderie. Is to have everybody see the, the, the future, that, that they can see their opportunity in that. And then secondly, that it's our right to win there, that, that we don't have to cede that to anybody. Tesla, any of them. At the all-important F-150 plant, Dearborn Assembly, the line workers were interested and concerned. I look to see what, what's going to become of it, you know, as far as stability. Uh-huh. Do you think stability will come from this? Hopefully, but we're not sure. Well, we need that. We need quicker, smarter, better here. You know, there's a lot to improve in this building that'll make the truck a lot better. Oh, do you think the future of the company is in good hands with Jim Hackett? I want to say yes, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. If not, the board will get rid of him right quick. Now, officially, Jim Hackett took over the helm on Friday, though they announced it this morning, spent his weekend going over what he might do, what he wants to do. He asked Bill Ford to take over the communications and the government outreach that uh, Mark Fields had done previously. He says he has to really concentrate on his team. And we're also expecting later in the week some of the lower level executive changes coming as he builds his team. Uh, and that'll sort of give us a feel for where they think this company is headed in the days and weeks and even months to come. Back to you. Well, Rod, we uh, heard you talking to the folks from Ford uh, working at the plant. What about the folks behind you at the glass house today? Well, you know, they don't like us talking to the, yeah. the white collar workers <laughs> so much, and it's kind of hard. But what ended up happening was I was asking some of the people that I knew, uh, was there an ovation for Jim Hackett? And the answer to that was yes. And then I started reading the faces in the crowd as they came out of the auditorium. And there wasn't a tear shed for Mark Fields anywhere, which I think in many ways tells you all you need to know about how this transition went. Mm -hmm. Well, and let's uh, turn our attention here to how it went over on Wall Street. Thanks, Rod. Uh, here's how the stock reacted to the news today. From the looks of it, investors liked it, too. Ford stock closing up 23 cents on the day. That's a move of a little over 2%. All right, we do have some breaking news to tell you about right now from Superior Township, where a body has been found in a car. Police say the man was slumped over in his car for multiple hours before somebody called police. At this point, it's unclear how the man died an investigation, though, is underway. Also developing right now, a Detroit man is now formally charged in the hit and run crash that took the life of a six month old. Little Demetrius Brown was killed. His two other siblings injured in the crash Thursday night on Detroit's west side. And now prosecutors say 31 year old DeAndre Cody was behind the wheel of the car that hit them. Coco McAvoy was in the courtroom as Cody was arraigned today. Coco. 
Yes, Kimberly and Devin and the baby's father, Demetrius Brown, was also in court. He says his family has been devastated after what happened. And though Cootie is facing a number of charges, the father says Cootie should be facing a murder charge as well. Case number is 1705805. 31 year old DeAndre Cootie in court today after police say he was the man behind the wheel of a hit and run crash that killed six month old Demetrius Brown and injured his family members. The judge read a number of charges but took the manslaughter charge away. Uh, strike that as to number seven. That does not apply to you, sir. Disappointing for the six month old baby's father, Demetrius Brown, who believes Cootie should have been charged with something tougher. The car rolled over three times, you know, and threw all my babies out of the car, and he just kept going. He should have been charged with second degree at least. Brown says the past few days for him and the child's mother have been... Pure hell. I don't get much sleep. You know, now we got to figure out how to bury my six-month-old six son. The baby's aunt, Jewel Wilson, says she still can't believe Cootie left the scene. It was literally raining babies and he walked away. He drove away. What kind of person does that? If the family could talk to Cootie, they would want to tell him this. You you killed a baby. He didn't he he hadn't even learned how to talk. He couldn't even crawl yet. And Cootie will be back in court next week for a probable cause hearing. Back to you. Coco, any idea how the other two children are doing uh, that were in that crash? I believe they were two and four years old. Yes, so the father says that those two are doing better physically. Of course, mentally, they're still oh, yeah. very traumatized, but he says they did have to have a lot of plastic surgery, and he's hoping they'll be released from the hospital either this week or next week. Yeah, we'll be thinking about them, and uh, certainly their road ahead. Okay, Coco, thank you. President Trump is in Israel tonight, second stop on his overseas tour. Earlier mixing diplomacy with a little bit of tourism, meeting with Israeli leaders, but also visiting the holy sites in Jerusalem. And one of those stops was historic, a first for a sitting U.S. president. Jay Gray just outside the walls of the old city in Jerusalem with a closer look. Jay. Good evening. All quiet in the old city tonight after what's been a very busy day on the ground here for President Trump, reaffirming the strong relationship between the United States and Israel, laying the groundwork for what he calls the ultimate deal and taking a swipe at reports he shared classified information with Russian officials. For the first time on his foreign tour, President Trump goes off script. Pressed on allegations he shared classified intelligence information with Russian diplomats, Mr. Trump said this. Just so you understand, I never mentioned the word or the name Israel. Never mentioned it during that conversation. They were all saying I did. So you had another story wrong. Though media reports didn't say that Mr. Trump named the Israelis during the Oval Office meeting. Mr. President, we are happy to see that America is back in the area. America is back again. In discussions today, first with Israeli President Reuven Rivlin and later with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the Allies confirmed their commitment to the war on terror, Mr. Trump again calling out Iran. The United States and Israel can declare with one voice that Iran must never be allowed to possess a nuclear weapon, never, ever, and must cease its deadly funding, training, and equipping of terrorists and militias. The president also clearly pushing to lay the groundwork for what he's called the ultimate deal, peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. I also look forward to working closely with you to advance peace in our region, because you have noted so succinctly that common dangers are turning former enemies into partners. I've heard it's one of the toughest deals of all, but I have a feeling that we're going to get there eventually, I hope. Between meetings today, the president and first family visited Jerusalem's old city, touring the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and other shrines. Mr. Trump viewing and making history. The first sitting U.S. president to pay his respects at the Jewish holy site. President Trump is spending the night in what's described as a bulletproof and bombproof suite at the King David Hotel. He will wrap up his Israeli trip tomorrow with a visit to Bethlehem and a meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Jerusalem. Jay Gray, Local 4.
All right, Jay, stay with NBC Nightly News here at 630. Lester Holt will be anchoring the program live from Jerusalem following the president on his first international trip. A little bit of a washout on Sunday. Nice seeing the sunshine back today. Really nice. Uh, but Ben's here now, and uh, we've got some more rain on tap, um, Ben. <laughs> yeah, don't get too used to these dry conditions. In fact, right now, the radar already showing showers crossing Lake Michigan. A lot of this stuff is going to dry up, so I don't think that we're really going to be in the threat of getting wet tonight. Tomorrow's a different story, especially in our north and west zones. We'll talk about that coming up, but a pretty pleasant evening and pretty close to average for this time of year. Upper 60s to low 60s. Should see a decent amount of sunshine in those breezy conditions will eventually uh, start diminishing once we get past sunset tonight. Of course, Memorial Day weekend coming up as we uh, head into the next seven days. We've got it in the forecast. We'll take a strong look at that coming up in a few minutes, guys. Ben. An investigation is underway in e-course after a worker died after falling from a scaffolding. The worker fell last night while working at the U.S. Steel facility on West Jefferson. The worker's identity has not been released, and at this time, police are still working to find out uh, what exactly caused the worker to fall. Brand new details into a deadly police chase in Milford. New tonight here, what one witness says he saw right before the chase came to its deadly conclusion. Jason? Moments ago, a motion for a mistrial in the case against the man accused to be behind the death of Michigan State Police Trooper Chad Wolf. We'll tell you what the judge decided. All right, Jason, the first heart stopping video as a burning roof falls on a Michigan firefighter next. New at six. A sidewalk along every street sounds like a great idea for a community like Royal Oak, but there are two big reasons people in one neighborhood are digging in for a fight to stop the mayor's plan. Plus, a local judge charged with sex crimes after accusations from women in his office has cut a deal. What he pleaded guilty to and what he hasn't, new at six. Some terrifying moments for a firefighter in the UP as he narrowly escapes a burning roof collapse. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Cell phone video showing the roof of a gas station collapsing onto a firefighter. This is in Iron Mountain on Saturday. The falling debris knocked the firefighter to the ground, trapping him in the flames and hot metal. He was freed about two minutes later thanks to his fellow firefighters. And amazingly, he was in and out of the hospital later that day. He's standing. Well, the trial of a man uh, that was driving the car that killed state trooper Chad Wolf began today. Wolf was riding his MSP motorcycle in 2015, about to get on the on ramp to I 75 North at Dix Highway when the car driven by Charles Warren turned from another lane onto the ramp. Wolf got tangled up in the small trailer Warren was hauling and was dragged for miles before he stopped. Jason Colthorpe is following the first day and joins us live with some late breaking developments here, Jason. Yeah, Kim, there was a motion late today for a mistrial by the defense after a witness used the term reckless to de describe the defendant's driving as he pulled into that rest stop at the end right before they finally discovered he was actually dragging Trooper Wolf. Uh, the judge denied that request, saying it was an accidental use of that, but they are going to keep an eye on testimony regarding those words from here on out. And both sides agree that this was a tragedy. The difference here is could it have been prevented? That's where the arguments begin. The prosecution is trying to prove Charles Warren was driving recklessly the morning of August 28, 2015, when he hit and killed state police trooper Chad Wolf. Reckless to the point that other drivers could see he was dragging something, yet he had no idea. He sees something hanging from the side of his trailer. They can't believe his eyes. But the defense says this will all come down to being just a tragic accident. When you see it and experience it the way that Charlie experienced it in real time as the events unfolded, it paints a much different picture. It paints a picture of a person who did not know that he was involved in an accident. What is he dragging? Kathleen O'Shea was on the road that morning and described what she saw. I was very concerned that the person in the car was going to catch on fire because the amount of sparks was very um, intense. And there's a motorcycle laying on the side of the road that are all crashed up, and I don't see nobody on it. The court also heard from a witness who called 911 that morning after finding Trooper Wolf's motorcycle. Well, you could tell the bike had skidded because it was all scratched, or bent up. The handlebars and everything were bent up. 
That was some dash cam video there from when they first arrived on the scene. Now, uh, it was also very dark that morning. One witness described it as incredibly dark. And it, during cross-examination late today, it was laid by the defense the possibility that they couldn't prove that the troopers' but lights were on on the motorcycle, putting it out there that maybe his lights weren't on, and that's why the defendant never saw him. Reporting live tonight, Jason Colt of Local 4. All right, Jason. Thank you. Nice day behind Jason, but as uh, Ben just told us, don't get used to it, huh? No, and we don't need any more rain. I mean, no. everything's lush and green. And, well, I, I mean, green. Exactly, yeah, green everywhere. Green. Can't get any greener <laughs> than it already is. Uh, but unfortunately, we do have more chances of rain, and it looks like some of those may be coming over the holiday weekend as well. Temperature department, we're doing pretty good. Slightly cooler than average. Average highs this time of year 72, and we're just about there. 69 at Metro, upper 60s across most of the area, and right at 70 degrees here on the east side. Usually we see some of the cooler numbers there, uh, but today it's some of the warmer spots. And believe it or not, even though yesterday was pretty much complete washout, these numbers are actually cooler than what we picked up on Sunday by almost 10 degrees in a couple spots. 7, 8 degrees cooler here in Flint. Metro and down at Monroe. So let's look at where the rain is because on the regional picture, there is not a whole lot of dry spots. This is a pretty active map uh, across the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley, uh, but it does look like we're getting the most sunshine right here across southern Michigan, northern parts of Indiana. Uh, the rain that is on the other side of the lakes, we told you at the top of the show, uh, probably going to fade as it moves off uh, to the east, and we'll check that out in your forecast in just a minute. Pollen report, we've been tracking high uh, pollen amounts for trees for most of the uh, last few weeks, but now the grass has started to pollinate too, which is, I guess, not surprising considering how much rain <laughs> we've had over the last couple weeks. And here's a look at tonight. Again, most of that stuff drying out to the west of us. I don't think that we're going to see a whole lot in the way of uh, showers tonight. Tomorrow, we're mainly going to be looking at our north and west zones and primarily in the afternoon, just a, a very stray shower possible in the morning. But once you get past about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe even 1 p.m. here, that's when we'll start seeing those showers form. And they'll be around again north and west of the city. By the time we get into the sunset hours, that should fade. But Rain chances do come back Wednesday and Thursday, and they look better and more uh, spread out than what we're going to be seeing here in the next 24 to 48 hours. 54 tonight. Clouds will be on the increase as uh, you saw the showers cross the lake. But again, I think a lot of the precipitation is going to dry out before it actually reaches the surface. 74 on the high side tomorrow. That's going to be one of our warmer numbers in our metro zone here in our four zone forecast. Pretty much all mid 70s. At least closer to Detroit. Downriver could be seeing right around 70 degrees. South zone temperatures pretty much mid 70s, except over towards Lake Erie, where we're looking at the upper 60s. And it's primarily 70s still here in our west zone and north zone, uh, despite the fact that that's where we're going to be seeing those shower chances tomorrow afternoon. And then the numbers get temporarily cooler on Wednesday and Thursday with those better chances of rain. But as we get into the upcoming weekend, temperatures are the one thing we got going for us mid to upper 70s. Yeah. We'll start out dry and then start working some showers in on Sunday and Memorial Day Monday. Don't forget, we're going to be at the Meyer in Warren tomorrow. It's our second severe weather alert radio day, so come on out and see us. Hard to believe that we have actually put 40,000 radios <laughs> in Metro Detroit <laughs> homes since we started this camp. That's phenomenal. Yep. Yep. That's great. All right, let's check in with the doctor. Well, it's a feature many believed would make cigarettes less harmful, but now new research suggests it could have had the opposite effect. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge, coming up, why researchers are sounding the alarm about filtered cigarettes. All right, Dr. McFerris, Senator Debbie Stabenow has some new competition for her Senate seat. We'll tell you who's thrown her hat into the ring and what's sure to be a heated race next. A businesswoman and Republican political activist today announced plans to run for the U.S. Senate next year against incumbent Democrat Debbie Stabenow. 35-year-old Lena Epstein has never held political office. She helps run her family's company, Vesco Oil. She was co-chair of Donald Trump's presidential campaign in Michigan. She says uh, Michigan wants a political outsider for the Senate. Michigan's Democratic Party says Epstein favors uh, cutting Great Lakes protection and raising health care costs. So the battle is now on. Now to a Local 4 update. Detroit's police chief tells Local 4 that he remains hopeful about the outlook for the officer who was shot in the head last month. Uh, chief Craig says he plans to visit the officer today after hearing reports of little progress in his critical condition. I just continue to ask Detroiters to continue to send their prayers up and let's be optimistic uh, that he'll make a full recovery. 
And so, uh, again, I'm hoping to get some better news today. Um, but he's still got a fight. He's still fighting. The officer was answering a domestic call April 30th on the city's west side when a gunman shot him. Police returned fire, killing that gunman. Well, Detroit Startup Week kicked off today. Entrepreneurs and aspiring business owners gathered earlier today at the Masonic Temple to kick off a, what will be a week of activities. Senator Gary Peters offered the opening remarks. Detroit Startup Week gives hopeful business owners the chance to learn and network with decision makers like those at J.P. Morgan and Chase and Google and Quicken Loans and a lot more. So it's now in its second year and participation in Detroit Startup Week is free. New at 5.30. Recent college grads looking for that new job not only need to clean up their resume, but you also need to take a close look at what you've posted online. Why one wrong post here on Facebook could cost you that big job. You see a police vehicle with those flashing lights? You think you know what it means. Not this vehicle. Community policing is not a program. It's a, it's a philosophy. It's about cops, community, and ice cream. A police pursuit from the Milford Police Department ended in a fatal crash. And we spoke to a man who witnessed what led up to this crash. We took shelter. I jumped in the car. We were afraid he was going to have a gun. Hear more from him and where police stand in their investigation. We also Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 530 starts now. A deadly chase with police leaves a lot of questions. Now we're hearing from someone who saw it all happen. And that tops our news at 530. Police say three men were riding around in a stolen vehicle, and when they tried pulling the driver over, he took off. Local 4's Coco McAvoy spoke to a man who was setting up for an event that morning at the park and witnessed part of the pursuit. I want to tell you about the moments leading up to the crash. The EZ Run Events group was setting up for a 5K race here at Martindale Beach in Kensington Park, and they encountered the driver police were looking for. And they say what happened after that was scary and unexpected. When somebody has nothing to live for, they don't care. Mo Hakani was setting up barricades for the 5K event. And this car ended up turning its life, lights off and driving over the grass and kind of hiding near the beach area. Then he saw a couple of cop cars and pointed the suspicious car out to them. Cop ended up putting the spotlight right on the vehicle. And the guy turned off his lights and started flying up and down the parking lot over the grass. Almost running Hakani over and he didn't care. He did 80 right past me. Then the pursuit started. One cop light, uh, turned his sirens on and just went right after him. The chase ended here on I-96 when the driver lost control and rolled over multiple times. Still many questions surrounding the case, like who was driving the vehicle and were the three men running because the car was stolen. You know, I've heard of stuff like that on the news. Played Grand Theft Auto back in the day as a kid, you know, but never ever thought somebody would, would steal a vehicle and flee the scene. Out here live now on the Milford Police Department has released new information about the suspects. They say two of the suspects are from Detroit and that the other is from Highland Park. They say that they believe they were in the Kensington Park area to do, quote, criminal activity, and they say they found belongings in their car that indicates that. Back to you. Coco, do we know why it's taking some time for police to identify who was driving the car? Yes, Karen. So police say because the crash was so bad, one of the men was ejected from the vehicle. The two others had to be extricated. And the two men who survived the crash, they're sedated in the hospital right now. So police aren't able to talk to them to figure out who the driver was. And they say they have to pull DNA off of the driver's seat airbag to determine that. And of course, if that person survived the crash, then they will face charges. Wow. All right, Coco McAvoy live for us tonight from Milford. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn says he will not testify in connection with Russia's influence on last year's election. Flynn served just three weeks, you'll recall, as President Trump's National Security Advisor before resigning. Now he's invoking his Fifth Amendment rights and refusing to turn over documents to the Senate as well. A rep from the House Intelligence Committee says his decision shows his guilt. This is the guy who claimed that no one would ever ask for immunity who had not committed a crime, and now he's asking for immunity. I think it speaks for itself. While Flynn is opting to sit out, two other former Trump employees, Paul Manafort and Roger Stone, have turned over documents to the Senate as part of their investigation.
Jury selection is underway in Pennsylvania for Bill Cosby's sexual assault trial, nearly 300 miles from where the trial will ultimately take place. The jury selection was moved after Cosby's lawyers wanted to find jurors who have not been influenced by the publicity of the trial. Cosby is being tried on charges that he drugged and molested a woman at his Montgomery County home back in 2004. The trial is expected to last at least two weeks. Weather-wise, not exactly a repeat of last week's big tornado outbreaks, fortunately. But some of those severe storms did cause some huge problems over the weekend in South Texas. And Ben joins us with what they're having to deal with. Yeah, not a tornado. I guess that's the important thing to point out. But take a look at some of this video because it is still pretty impressive. Some of the worst damage was in the city of Laredo, which was along the Mexican border. Storms swamp streets. They knocked over power poles and trees. And in one instance, a live power line fell and electrocuted a 15 year old kid. A storm damage seen all across town. One of the stations down there said that one place receiving heavy rain was the World Trade Bridge. 18 wheelers knocked on their sides. Uh, bridges on the Mexican side and the roof of the Mexican customs facility also damaged with some parts being torn off by high winds. So I know a lot of people just, you know, they tend to ignore severe thunderstorm warnings because yeah, it's not a yeah. tornado, but you see stuff like this. You're in the middle of it. Got to respect yeah, it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you, Ben. Police in, uh, Roy in Oak Park, rather, have come up with a pretty sweet way to connect with the community. At a time when police relations have been strained across the country, Oak Park police are using ice cream as a way to break the proverbial high. Steve Garagiola was there today. Steve? It's an innovative approach to crime fighting, arming a police vehicle with ice cream. I think they're on to something. Among the greatest challenges for police officers in any city is developing a positive relationship with folks in the community. What better way to bridge the gap than with ice cream? You know what they say about you never get a second chance to make a first impression? So we would like the first impression to be a, a pleasant one. The Oak Park Police ice cream truck will visit community events, sometimes just roll into neighborhoods giving away ice cream, as in free. We always talk about wanting to humanize the badge. Um, we're not just a uniform, we're a person inside that uniform. This is a chance for us to interact with citizens. They get to know us a little bit and see the human being that is inside the uniform and behind the badge. There's no city money or tax dollars spent on this project. The van, the freezer, the artwork on the truck, the ice cream, all donated by businesses in Oak Park. We're going to donate 300 units a week to the Oak Park Police Department in the truck and uh, and supply the ice cream for him. Why would you want to get involved? The actual question is why not? Why, why wouldn't you help? You, you know, they should, everybody should help. If you see this police vehicle in your rear view mirror, you'll be glad to pull over. In Oak Park, I'm Steve Garagiola, Local 4. I love that. You don't have a second chance to make a first impression. Exactly right. And ice cream's a pretty and good And ice cream's answer. a pretty yep. good impression. Now to good health, could filtered cigarettes be doing more harm than good? That is the suggestion of a new study that claims that the design could actually be boosting levels of a specific type of lung cancer. So let's bring in Dr. Frank McGeorge to explain exactly what the study shows. Well, Karen and Devin, you know, while the overall number of people who develop lung cancer in the U.S. continues to go down, a certain type called adenocarcinoma is actually on the rise. And ironically, researchers believe the increase could have to do with a change that some thought would make cigarettes less harmful. Marsha Harris smoked for 10 years, but she quit more than 30 years ago. She didn't like the taste of most brands, so she opted for something smoother. I just know it was menthol and it was light. Marsha is now being treated for lung cancer. Researchers say a feature of those lighter cigarettes may have increased her odds. The tobacco burns more slowly at a lower temperature. This makes for relative amounts of more dangerous chemicals to be in the smoke. Cigarettes, once marketed as light, have a filter and tiny holes to allow smokers to breathe in air along with smoke. Thoracic oncologist Dr. Peter Shields says that makes them smoother, but it also forces more chemicals deeper into the lungs. The public health community thought that those holes were a good thing and there were unintended consequences. Shields and his fellow researchers are calling for tough new regulations. Those filter holes is what's doing it. And we think there's enough evidence now that the Food and Drug Administration can just say, take the holes out. Marsha thinks the changes could make smoking less appealing to some. I had tried non-menthol and didn't care for those. And I had tried stronger and, and didn't care for those either. 
Now, Shield says almost all the cigarettes on the market now have the holes, not just the ones that used to be called lights or ultralights. It's interesting. We used, when we used to see people smoking non-filtered cigarettes, we thought those oh. were the people that were really flirting with yeah, danger, right? Exactly. And it turns out these changes, maybe with you know some intention of making yeah, it easier yeah. to smoke, probably did and are making it actually much That's worse. The intentions, yeah. Yeah. Thank all right, Doc. Some uh, very good news tonight for a storied Detroit landmark. Thanks to a seven-figure donation, construction will now be able to be completed on the Pathfield Complex at the old Tiger Stadium site. But as Nick Monticelli shows us, this donation isn't all about construction. It's also about kids. If you've been anywhere near Old Tiger Stadium recently, you know there's a lot of work going in. The stadium is almost done, but the Detroit Police Athletics League knew they needed some help to get to the finish line. Well, today they announced they got that help. The corner of Michigan and Trumbull holds dear memories for many Detroiters, and even though Tiger Stadium is gone, the thought is that memories can still be made. The corner ballpark will soon be the new home of the Detroit Police Athletics League. And now they have enough money to complete the stadium, thanks to Adiant and a $2.8 million donation. When this opportunity presented itself, yeah, it was just a, a no-brainer for us because we uh, very much, uh, as part of our values, feel it's really important to be part of the communities uh, where we work. Make that where they will work. Adiant is the largest supplier of automotive seats, and the company is moving to Detroit. So they're investing before they're even here, making sure this pal field of dreams becomes reality. It was going to be tough. You know, we always knew we were looking for that real good partner to be our stadium sponsor partner. And, uh, you know, once we started having conversations with Adia, and I tell you, it moved really quickly. The corner ballpark will be much more than a ballpark, though. Here, kids can be involved in baseball, softball, t-ball, football, soccer, cheerleading, and more. And it's looking like those memories are already being made. We don't do nearly enough uh, for the young people in this community, but through the efforts of PAL, of Adian, and everybody else here, it's a great step forward for the youth of Detroit. At the Corner Ballpark in Corktown, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Chief James Craig was also there and says crime stats prove there is a direct connection to providing programming to kids and keeping crime down. Still ahead, a deadly case of road rage under investigation on the west side of the state. New at 530, what happened on this road that had a man with a gun calling 911? Also, the warning signs were there. An American doctor among the dead at what's known as the most dangerous place on earth. Before you apply for a new job, you better take a moment to check out what you've posted on different websites, like on Facebook. Important information from the experts coming up. Coming up tomorrow morning on Local 4 News Today, wake up with us for all the big stories that break while you're sleeping. Plus, traditional dishes with a modern twist, a downtown Detroit spot focusing on foodies and sports fans with 100% homemade grub. We've got it. Tasty Tuesday at 6 a.m. Oh, does that look good? Also, weather and traffic always on the fours. Detroit mornings start here from 4.30 to 7 a.m. See you in the morning. Who is new at six? The death last week of rock icon Chris Cornell has shined the spotlight on suicide and some startling new information on who are the people most vulnerable. I'll have that later on Local 4 News. All right, Steve, plus for the first time in a very long time, there are new recommendations from doctors on what babies should and should not be drinking. That's new at six in good health. It is graduation season, so across Metro Detroit, hundreds of thousands of uh, students are getting their diplomas. Oh, so excited mm -hmm. to take that next step in their life. But before they embark on their next big adventure, finding a job, our consumer investigator Hank Winchester shows us there's one important thing they should do before sending in that resume. New graduates are probably busy tweaking their resume, making sure everything is just right. But let me ask you a question. Have you taken time to check out your social media accounts like your Facebook page? Because what you have posted there could prevent you from getting that big job. Employers admit almost as soon as graduates fill out a job application, their life story is being scrutinized online. They're Googling us. They're learning about us before they make that decision of 
who they want to bring in for their interview. That's why social media experts like Irene Kohler says, now's the time to tweak and clean up your online image. Take a look at everything that you've got online that is public and ask yourself, hmm, is that really part of the impression I want to make? As many have learned the hard way, it's almost impossible to undo what's done online. But she says you can accentuate the positive. Your education, your uh, work experience, internships, skills, those kinds of things. Even go as far as to post a video of yourself doing exactly what a company does. We're more likely to get to grab their attention and move to the next step in the hiring process. Social media experts say it's also a good idea to check out your privacy settings. It's easy to do on a site like Facebook. You want to make sure those settings are up to date so people can't tag you in a post without your permission. We have more tips for you on the consumer page of our website. Click on Detroit.com. I'm Hank Winchester. We're not cutting you off, Hank, but we appreciate it. Absolutely, right? <laughs> We're just eager to get out to Jamie. Exactly. Who is live at Oakland Hills tonight for the uh, Champs Vermont golf outing. Oh, and it is a beautiful day to tee it up, Jamie. It was absolutely a beautiful day. This is one of the perks of the job, I have to say. But the reason why everyone is out here is for Children's Hospital. $575,000 raised for research, and that's what's important. And here's the headliner, Justin Leonard, the Open champion, Ryder Cup champion. You were just telling stories with everyone over there about that putt you made. I mean, come on. I, it goes in every time. It was fun from the 99 Ryder Cup. Um, and so much fun to be here. The golf was a little harder than it usually is when I come to play charity events. A, I'm not playing much anymore. I'm doing more broadcasting. But B, it's Oakland Hills. I know, it's Oakland Hills. It's Oakland Hills. <laughs> this place is the monster. So you're retired, and you were saying Oakland Hills is hard. It is very hard. It was hard playing the U.S. Open here in 96. It was hard playing the PGA Championship. I used to, when I come... When I do events like this, I used to look forward to the golf and then the speaking afterwards and telling stories was kind of a struggle. Now that I'm doing more broadcasting, I enjoy the storytelling more than I do the golf. But we had a great day. And you were saying he's a real broadcaster now, you guys. He got one of the IFBs that we all have molded to his ear. So you can really speak about golf because you played it. I, and it's something that I know. And so um, when I first started doing it, I, saw, I tried to be a, a, an announcer or an analyst or this you know, media person. And I, I've gotten more comfortable to where I'm just being myself. And, uh, but yeah, I knew I was like fully committed when I got the IFB mold for my ear, which is a gross feeling, by the way. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, so we talked about the Ryder Cup. Your putt sealed it for the Americans. How about winning the Open Championship over there across the pond? Well, and it was so fun is Mike Tirico was here um, living in Ann Arbor. He played today, and as he and I were over there, we're telling stories, and I didn't even realize that his first major championship uh, that he worked on was the 97 Open at Troon, which is the one that I won. And so we've got a nice history, and then we just worked together eight or nine days ago down at Sawgrass. And so we're kind of coming full circle, and, and um, you know, he's been a big help to me in, in my early career. All right, Justin, thanks so much. I don't know if you know this, but my team tied for the lead. So it's kind of like the Open Championship. Congratulations. <laughs> so thanks to Justin. We'll hear from Mike Tirico. We'll also hear from Bernie on Wednesday night because there's a special coming in. It's uh, James McCann, Stan Van Gundy, Justin Abdelkader, and their significant others. Uh, they're going all in. And for the first time ever, Matthew Stafford and his wife Kelly talking about life as parents. How about that? That's Wednesday night at 8. And a little bit of sports news to send it back to Annabelle Sanchez sent to AAA. We'll talk about that more oh. at 6 o'clock with Mike Tirico. Yeah. Back to you. Oh. Tough at that price tag, that's for sure. All right, that's really cool. Thank you very Hanging much, Hanging out with Jamie. Justin Leonard at yeah. Oakland Hills. We nice should have day. said thank you very much, Jamie, yeah, yes, in that, yes, news, in that voice. news voice. <laughs> and, and, and he's right. You know you've arrived when you've had to put that goo that's in right. your ear. And that's how it. you're different from the Secret Service. <laughs> those guys don't get It's not the molded Generic. piece. Generic. Anybody yeah. could wear those things. It's on only one people. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, check out what we've got on Fort Live Radar, which is just some light showers. That's it. Uh, that's all. It's making it on the other side of the lake right now. Uh, and I think that's even going to dry up before it gets here. There's a little bit more uh, further off to the south, but I don't think that that's going to be a huge issue for us tonight. Tomorrow, 
Chances get a little bit better. Temperature wise, as Jamie was saying, uh, really couldn't ask for a much better day. We're slightly below average, but it is still very comfortable out there. Low humidity. That's the other thing. Even as temperatures are going to warm up towards the end of the forecast, dew points are not going to get much higher. We may get into the mid and upper 50s, but that's still negligible humidity, especially for this time of year. Lows tonight going down to the low and mid four, uh, 50s rather clouds on the increase. And again, that shower possible out to our north and west, but I really don't think we're going to see anything until tomorrow. It's the afternoon afternoon hours. We could be seeing a shower, especially in some of those same locations. Here's what's going to go down over the next seven days. You see the average this time of year going to be in the low 70s, slightly below that Wednesday and Thursday with the better chances of rain. But we make up for it this weekend mid to upper 70s for the three day stretch or I guess four days, depending on how long you're going to stretch this into. Here's today's Hanson's weather window as we go downtown. This is a look down at the Ambassador Bridge from uh, Detroit side. Looks great out there. You can't tell that the uh, everything's moving. Don't those trees almost look like they're bottoms of palm trees. Yes, kind this, of. This could be. It looks like yes. it's a little tropical. It's a little tropical it looking. It does Why not? kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, Thanks. Uh, in England, the story of a real diamond in the rough. New here at 530, where this massive gem was found and how it only cost its new owner 13 bucks. But first, a deadly case of road rage under investigation on the west side of Michigan, and that's next. You've heard about laundry pods and button batteries, but that's just the start of everyday items that pose a hazard for your kids. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Tomorrow at 5, I'll show you some surprising things that kill and injure children each year and how to avoid these accidents in your home. A young